Good evening, everybody. Hello. I'm going to turn off the comments, but you're able to make a, ask a question in the question box. And today we're going to look at effective studying and a check on if you're on the right path. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are common sense, but sometimes we need to be reminded of these common sense ideas. And so we're going to talk about, we're going to ask the question, are you studying effectively? And if not, how can we change it? Now, before we do that, I'm going to just do a brief announcement that there will be a pronunciation class or weekly course beginning in November, so you don't want to miss it. I will have um, details next week, and then we can get started on improving your accent and pronunciation. So I'm very much looking forward to that. That will happen in November, so don't miss it. All right, there are two approaches to studying English. One is that you approach it as a hobby, you enjoy it, it's for leisure, and you have no real fixed goals. The other is purpose-driven. You're studying it for a reason, you have an objective. And so I wanna talk about the second, I'm assuming the second option today, that it's a purpose-driven reason for studying English. And most of, for most of us, it's related either to education, studying at a university, or getting a better job. So we're gonna take a look at these options. Now the key premise, uh, the key premise is the sort of basic understanding. The key premise of the live is that many people lose or waste time studying things that are not directly relevant to their goals. And so what we wanna do is check yourself, ask yourself, all right, in, is what I'm doing the most efficient way of going about it? So this is like a checkup, a study checkup to see if you're on the right path. Now, feel free to ask questions. I will look at these questions near the end, well, in the middle and near the end. So if you have questions, hit the question box and then go below and I, I will um, answer, write your question. I will look at it in a minute. All right. The first thing you need to do in order to study effectively is to clarify your goal. I have listed a few goals here. I want to pass the IELTS with a seven in order to study at a good university, or maybe I want to reach B1 so that I can um, travel and be and not be stressed, or I want to past the Cambridge B2 so that I can work in Greece for the summer, or I want to get a BA degree so that I can be a teacher. So these are all rather specific goals because they have a, a goal in mind with an, 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 a, a fixed, um, sort of a fixed goal, English goal that you can attain. So these are quite good. So my question that I want to ask you right now, and I'd like you to think about it, is what is your goal? Why are you studying English? And I'd like you to write it down or think about it. It's best if you write it down, actually, but think about it. Because if you look at the bottom, if you don't know what your goal is, it's certain that you're studying ineffectively or inefficiently. Because... Without a fixed goal, you, you're studying everything and nothing. So it's good to have a fixed goal. Do you know what that is? So think about it. Now, if you're a teacher, you, the goal might be that you're getting approved uh, sort of more specializations for job fulfillment. You know, your, your, your school gives you bonuses or um, pay increases if you do, you know, sort of these regular educational seminars. So what is your goal? What is your goal? This is really critical. So if you don't have this part down, then we're wasting a little bit of our time with all of the rest. This is the first 
item of business that you need to really settle on. All right, let's continue. I'll assume you've thought and done that. If you haven't, you've got to give serious thought to it and you will save a lot of time by um, focusing in on what you really want. So what's the key idea? The more specific and concrete the goal, the more efficient you can be. So here's a poorly defined goal. This is what most people say. I wanna improve my English to get another job or to get a better job. That's very vague. That's not going to motivate you probably. And it's certainly not gonna help you be more effective in your studying. So what's a better, a well-defined goal? I want to work in an international hotel and I need B1 writing skills to respond to client emails and B2 speaking skills to answer customer complaints or guest complaints and questions. These are specific and attainable. And the more specific your goals are, the faster you get there and the more efficiently and effectively. So you need less time as well. This is really important. It's interesting that very, if you're a teacher out there, this is something you should require of all students you're teaching privately or their parents if they're if they're the kids are young the children are young maybe their parents need to answer this question sometimes it's obvious but the more specific you are especially as you get older the more specific you are the better the, the better the teacher can help you so that's why i think for teachers you should know very precisely with this much detail what the student has in mind. If the student can't give you a clear answer, then teaching them is going to be more difficult because you won't know if you succeed because there's no fixed goal. And that's generally a frustrating enterprise. So you want to be aware of that if you're a teacher. All right. Now, before we move on to this section, let me look at a few questions. Um, hmm. All right, a lot of these I might be addressing later, so let's continue. And if I don't address it, I will address it at the end. So the two most difficult questions that students face, where and how to begin, and which resources to use. Now, if you are fortunate enough to be able to have a private teacher, these two questions are often made for you. The teacher will provide these or answers to these questions. But most of us don't have that opportunity. And so we're gonna answer these questions now. Where and how to begin and which resources to use because there are many. So let's begin by addressing the first question, where to begin. Now this question can only be answered by looking at the following. Assess your present level, so what's your level currently? Define your goal, which we just talked about, and then emphasize areas of greatest need. Now if you notice, this is all very logical, all common sense, but what's interesting is Few of us take the time to actually write these things down and clarify everything. Now, how do you assess, let's look at all three of these, how to assess your present level. Interestingly, for me, I've been receiving a lot of emails from students who don't know what their level of English is, and that's fine. There are two very popular links, credible popular links that you can use for free to find out your level of English. So here they are. Maybe you want to take a photo of it and you can Google the beginning of it. Cambridge English, which is part of Cambridge University. And then the British Council has their own site. Both of these are very legitimate links that will allow you to assess your English level. So that's the first. Then define the goal, which we've already talked about. So you have your level set, you know your goal, and then you have to get there. Now I have two charts I wanna show you. Both are common sense. 
but again, sometimes we forget to do them. So here's, um, so here's what we have. In the first part, we have an assessment, our self-assessment, or an outsider assessment of our reading, writing, listening, and speaking, what our current level is, which is in the gray, and what our goal is, which is in the yellow. So if you look, the, what is it, the reading and the writing are the two areas of greatest need in this example. So you, you're at a seven and you need a 10. As an example, you need to hit a 10 level and you're at seven. Whereas in speaking and listening, you're at, you're at a nine and you need a 10. So it should seem rather obvious, but this is what, this is just very straightforward. This is what you should be doing. You should be spending 35, about one third of your time with writing and with reading. That is, so if you have 20 hours a week, then seven hours writing, seven hours reading, and three hours speaking and listening. In other words, you should apportion, apportion is a great word, apportion is to measure out, apportion, A-P-P-O-R-T-I-O-N. You should apportion your time according to the areas of greatest need. This should be a conscious effort on your part. Too often, what I see is that students love to gravitate. When you gravitate, you move in a natural direction. Gravitate to areas of their strength, greatest strengths, because it feels good to succeed. And it's not comfortable to struggle in areas. So th this is why we need to be reminded of it, because it's very easy then to focus on speaking and listening because we're rather good at it. And technically, we do need to improve, but we need to proportion, uh, apportion our time according to our greatest weaknesses or greatest areas of need. So my question to you is, are you apportioning your time appropriately? Are you addressing the greatest areas of need or are you avoiding it? Because a lot of human nature, we love to avoid difficult situations. We don't like it. We don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to fail. We don't like to struggle. But what this is suggesting is we need to face our weaknesses and our difficult, you know, the areas of greatest need if we want to be most efficient in attaining or meeting our goals. This is really critical. We all understand the concept, but how many of us are doing it? Now, this is very interesting and something I want only you can answer, but it's something you should think about very seriously. Where to begin for new learners? I'm receiving a lot of emails, a lot of direct messages from students or people who are, they're new and they don't know where to begin. This is a great question, where to begin. I'm gonna suggest that you begin in two places, assuming that it's just, you wanna begin learning English in a sort of normal manner, which is speaking first. So assuming it's not for a very specialized reason, um, I'm going to assume then that you want to start speaking s s straight away and you want to start studying grammar. Now, I want to tell you why I suggest these two. If you start speaking, you're naturally going to start listening because someone will have to talk back to you, which is why my post on Monday, which is still running today on language exchange, is so very critical for, li for learners. It doesn't matter the age, uh, the, the, the level, but especially young learners. It doesn't matter if you struggle. Start to speak consistently. Now, why is grammar important? Because grammar gives you, helps you to understand how the language is built, the structure of the language. This is very important as speaking then will be accelerated as you apply your grammar knowledge to new areas, you can sort of guess how the sentences are going to work once you start to develop an understanding of how the language lays out or how the, how the language functions. Now, we all know that, that language, the English language is not regular, not normal, not predictable when it comes to articles pronunciation, prepositions, 
and irregular verbs. So we're going to struggle in these areas regardless. But what grammar will help you do is conjugate verbs and decline nouns and give you a sort of uh, help you understand the pattern of English so that it will facilitate your speaking. It will help you to speak. So I recommend for younger learners speaking and grammar in conjunction. And hopefully this symbiotic relationship, this is a big word, symbiotic means two different areas that help each other. So this symbiotic relationship between speaking and grammar will begin to take effect. Now, I, will, I wanna say one thing about the other areas. For me personally, um, writing and reading were the two areas that helped me move from a good vocabulary to, we could say, um, a rich vocabulary. So I knew that when I wrote, read something and then I wrote it down or I actually used it in one of my articles, I never forgot it because I used it actively. And the problem with expanding your vocabulary when you're at an intermediate or advanced level, it's more difficult to do that with speaking because it goes so quickly. It's running very quickly. With reading and with writing, you slow the process down. Writing, of course, is an active form of communication. So this is the most effective. Uh, this and speaking are active forms of communication, but writing slows down the process and helps your mind, uh, your brain sort of codify these things and remember it longer. Reading is more passive, but it allows you to expose you to good structure if you're reading good books and good language. And of course, a rich vocabulary. All right. Now, I wonder if I should ask, look for a few questions here. Okay, I'm speaking too quickly. I knew I was speaking too quickly. Thank you for that. I will speak more slowly. All right. I'm seeing a lot of questions. I want to continue because I'm not sure... Let's go through the whole presentation and then, because it's not long, we're nearly actually finished. I want to give, okay, let's talk about which resources to use. Then I'll answer your questions at the end. So please wait and I will get to your questions. Which resources to use? So we had a few questions early on, just to recap. Where to begin, how to begin, and which resources to use. So I've suggested in most cases, begin speaking, and that's why this language exchange post that I've made is very important. And then I've also suggested grammar study in conjunction with speaking because it facilitates understanding how the language is built. Now, what about resources? This is surprisingly controversial. And I say surprisingly because for me, it's rather obvious and straightforward which resources you should use. But I don't see this being discussed very often and I'm curious to see what English teachers or future teachers have to say about this. This is my opinion. I have a very strong opinion on it actually, but I am curious to hear your ideas. Let's talk about textbooks, English language textbooks. Are they important? Are all textbooks the same? And which do we trust if they're not the same? So in terms of resources, the first natural question is what about textbooks, English language textbooks? Here's, here are my thoughts. And I know a lot of people share these thoughts, but not everyone. I think people disagree. So are they important and trustworthy? Yes, they are. If from a good publisher, I've listed a few here, Macmillan, Oxford, Cambridge, Pearson, National Geographic has a lovely but very expensive <laughs> course book. These are well done. And why can we trust them for the most part? Because they're written by experts, people who know the field. They, are metho uh, they do methodology. They're experts in methodology and in course development. These big publishers hire good people to make course books. Now, 
we don't as teachers i don't i don't see the need to reinvent the wheel now this is a this is a this is an idiom to reinvent the wheel means to start all over again when we have perfectly good resources and chances are much better than what we could do there's no sense reinventing the wheel when we have good resources available now does that mean you have to follow it exactly and not tailor it? To tailor something is to make it individual. We don't, you can certainly tailor these books to the individual needs of the client. I'm not suggesting that you don't be creative and that you don't complement or add to what the book does. But as a basis or a based sort of a, a, a program of study, in many cases, if not most cases, this is more than apt. It's very good. And I would recommend for most teachers, especially new teachers, to use these. Um, now, if you're a very specialized, experienced teacher and you have an individual with a very special need, English language need or request, obviously I'm not speaking to you. But I'm speaking to the majority of people who are teaching groups or individuals with rather straightforward language needs. Textbooks are the way to go. They give direction in a way that we as individual teachers probably won't be consistent. So I would definitely recommend it. Let's give an example. Now these are very obvious, but I want to state them because I don't hear the obvious being spoken enough. So here we go. Um, Let's just take a look. All right, you're taking the IELTS. Excuse me, you can't see that. You're taking the IELTS exam. So what's the best option to study from a recent IELTS exam book from a good, reputable publisher? What's the second best option? To study from an older IELTS exam book which still teaches this based on the most recent exam version. In other words, the exam books from good publishers, old or new, will always be the most efficient way than cobbling together. Cobbling together means that you take from very different sources and you combine. Then cobbling, it will always, these books will always be better than cobbling together disparate sources. This is a big word. Disparate means very different. Disparate, B D I S. P-A-R-A-T-E. It's a great word. So I'm going to repeat that sentence because that's a big sentence. These the IELTS textbooks from reputable publishers will always be better than cobbling together disparate sources and teaching in that manner. The third best option is what I've just mentioned, cobbling sources together, disparate sources, and teaching them. One more example. What if you're interested in doing business or hotel, um, st you know, working in a hotel in some management or at the front desk? It just makes sense to look at market leader. We have business one on one or business building. These are big publishers with solid textbooks. These aren't the only three. I've just listed three. There are many others, but it makes sense to start with these especially if you can afford it. I, I understand that these books are not cheap. And so th there's an issue with price and affordability. And I understand that. But all things being equal, you should look. This is the most obvious common sense beginning. All right, now I'm finished. I want to take your questions and we have a lot of them. So the rest of the time, is for the questions, but before we do that, I wanna remind the latecomers that we have a pronunciation course that's going to begin in November. I'm going to discuss details next week, so don't miss it. We're gonna start improving our accent and pronunciation in November, every week, and I'm really excited to begin that. So let's look at your questions here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
All right, my English level is zero. How can I start? I've just mentioned start by finding a language exchange partner and picking up a beginning grammar book. Two things is what I would recommend. Don't speak so fast. I will speak slower. Thank you. Okay, this is interesting. A good question. I'm between B1 and B2. I want to have aisles at a 7 or 7.5. So you've, okay, so here you have, you have you've assessed where you're at. You've, you've, you've fixed your goal, but we need still more detail. We need to know what your level is in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So you need to go into more detail and address the areas that don't reach 7 or 7.5. I will speak, Silas. <clears throat> IELTS, this is a great question. IELTS is an international English exam which allows you to study it at English-speaking universities, mainly in America and in England or the United Kingdom, but not only, also Australia and other areas where English language is the um, language of the institution. Good question. Okay. Um, very good. Hello, Bangladesh. Nice to see you. This is a good question. I'm studying to be a doctor, and so I need to have very good fluency. That's right. So if you're studying to be a doctor, there are two areas that you need to really focus on. The first, obviously, is medical English. This is obvious, and all good medical courses have a, a, a class in medical English. And then the second one is just conversational English. You have to be able to converse with your client before the meeting and during and after. So, you know, a very um, conversational style English combined with very specialized medical knowledge. And those are the two focuses. And I wouldn't deviate, deviate means to move around. I wouldn't deviate from these two paths until you're very efficient in both. Right. Um, someone's asked how to improve pronunciation. I've just told you we're going to have a course and you're going to join me every week and we're going to improve that. All right. This is interesting. Now, this is a great question that everybody, I think, at one point or another has. How to solve the grammar problem. Now, let's, let me tell you what I'm hearing. Gram Here's what I'm hearing. Number one, grammar is boring to study. And number two, grammar is boring to study. So here's how we get around that. At, that's why I, I suggested speaking and studying. So as you're speaking and you run into issues with, your, with the spoken language, then you can refer back to the grammar in a very specific way to address a question you have from your problems with speaking. And in this way, grammar becomes relevant and interesting. In other words, you use grammar, the grammar study, as a problem-solving exercise. Then it becomes interesting and highly relevant and important, and it's no longer boring. And that, so you have to find creative ways to make subjects that are let's say not so interesting, interesting. There are creative ways to do that for all of us. We just need to think about it. I've given you one way there. Uh, approach grammar as a problem solving um, sort of exercise. <clears throat> all right. I'm looking for other questions. G 
Great. Someone wants to become an actor. This is very important. Okay. I'm just making a note here. One second. All right. Now, this is a great question. I would call this a conundrum. Do we know what a conundrum is? A conundrum is a very difficult puzzle, um, which is difficult, difficult to solve. How can, how can we be excellent in English when my natives don't speak English? So, in other words, I'm around people who don't speak English well. How can I improve my English? Well, first of all, you have an opportunity to find a language partner in my post from Monday. That's number one. Secondly, you have my lives each week and videos. You can listen to good English and, you know, start to sort of attune or adjust your ears to good English. Thirdly, you have YouTube. And you can listen to videos from native speakers there. I will be starting <laughs> YouTube soon. I've been saying this for months. I've been procrastinating. Actually, I haven't had time, but we are going to start that very soon. So these are ways to get around a very real obstacle of um, native, no, no, lack of native speakers in your area. All right. <clears throat> All right, I'm just looking here for others. This is a, a common feeling amongst many of us. I'm stuck at B1, B2, how can I go higher? Now, this is a common occurrence. So what happens when we're studying, we'll have a spurt. A spurt is quick growth, very fast growth. We'll have a spurt and we'll get to maybe B, uh, A2 quite quickly, and then we'll level off. To level off means we don't improve. We level off for a period of time, and then we might have another smaller spurt or growth or improvement up to B1, B2. My advice is the following, because I I've studied this quite a bit. And if you're consistent, you will get through these slow, dry periods, these periods where you see no progress. Don't stop, don't quit, keep moving, and then you will move on. But it might take months. You might be stuck studying consistently for months with no progress. That's just how our brain works. We don't learn in a very linear fashion. We learn in this way. So if we study consistently, we will see jumps. But the key is to be consistent even when we see no progress. And this is difficult for most of us. We get discouraged. And that's the time, exactly the time when you don't need to get discouraged. <clears throat> All right, let me see any other questions. Do you suggest listening to English podcasts for improving? Yes, especially if you like the voice, the language that's being used. It's a perfect opportunity to improve or enhance your listening skills. Can a native speaker score nine in the aisles? Um, I hope so, <laughs> but not all, not, not all of them. And they certainly wouldn't, many of them wouldn't in the, in the writing. But uh, to be honest, native, if your qualified teacher is a native, you should be able to score much higher than nine. If you look at nines of these exams, they're good. Uh, the writing is good, but it's not, it's not amazing. So they should, if they're professional teachers, they should be, be able to score higher than that, even though there is no higher um, mark. <clears throat> All right, I'm looking here. A lot on pronunciation. I've told you about that. 
Okay, someone has asked, and I've got a lot of questions on this, how can I find a language partner from your post? Can I tell you what I'm seeing from my perspective? Everyone is posting and no one is commenting on other people's posts. So I literally have hundreds of posts of people interested right next to each other and no one's interacting with anyone. So when you post, you should comment on three to five other posts. The, everyone's looking, but no one's interacting. Well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of people are. To date, we have more than 600, 700 people have found partners. Four, five, about five, 600 are still looking, but there are so many right next to you. So how do you find a partner? Comment on three to five posts that interest you. Go down the list, look at the newest comments first. Not the top comments, but the newest comments. And you'll see a lot of people with no one, just waiting for an answer. So you can be that partner. It's very easy to do. You just need to write a few people. And don't worry if a few say no. They might already have a partner. Is the pronunciation course free? That's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about this. I think I'm going to do two things. Now, I haven't decided yet, but I will tell you, I'm thinking of, for those who have access to PayPal, of charging $4 a month, $1 a lesson. Um, and those who don't have access to PayPal, it will be free if they, ta if they share the post and tag me. So if they share the post and tag me, then they get involved. If they have access to PayPal in your country, then it would be, I think I'm going to, I think it's $4. It will not be higher than $4 a month. So this is, I think, very reasonable. I want to make it accessible to everybody. Um, and I think that's a fair way to do it. Uh, you can let me know if you have any other ideas, but I'm trying to make it fair and yet um, productive for everybody. Okay, this is a good question. How can I improve my vocabulary? Because sometimes I can't talk. I can tell you how I improve my vocabulary. I improved it by reading and writing. Now, I realize most of us don't have to write. So this is a little bit of a problem. But I, I do have to write because I'm a writer. So this is very easy for me to do. So I'm able to remember big words because I'm using them actively after I read them. I read them and I think, oh, I like that word. And I ask myself, have I ever used that word in a publication? If not, I pull it out and I put it in my next article because I also am learning just like you. So how do you expand? When you're exposed, when you encounter a new word, Write it down. Keep a list. I had a list when I was at Oxford. I had a list of English words, mainly from my professor, because he was, I think, the greatest stylist I've ever read in my, in my field, maybe in any field. He's just a remarkable writer. And so I would write down all of the new words in his books that I had never used, and then I would make sentences, or actually I would even remember some of his sentences. And then later I used them as my own. So this is why if I speak sometimes in a way you haven't heard, you have to <laughs> blame it on my professor at Oxford. All right. All right. Let me see if we have any other questions. Linguistics. Linguistics means language, aspects of language. Lingua comes from tongue, actually. And so for a lot of, a lot of uh, languages, tongue and language are synonymous. And in fact, in English, we also use the word tongue to mean language. So how many tongues does he speak? It's not common, it's formal, but it is used. Tongues and language. How can I practice speaking? How can I practice speaking? By speaking. Speak 
often. Get, a, get an exchange partner who has the same level of commitment. Maybe it's just once a week. Maybe it's three times a week. This is not easy to find. So don't be discouraged if you find a partner, but you have different goals. You just have to find a new partner. That's fine. If you're committed to three times a week and you're dependable, you need to find someone with the same level of commitment. It's not easy. Now, the good news is I'm posting language exchange every month. So you'll all, you're all you going to have an opportunity each month to find someone new if it didn't work out. So don't panic. And uh, we're, 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 we're going to refine the system so it will be easier next month when I post it. It will be easier for you to find a language exchange partner. We're making changes with each month. So wait for it and don't lose hope. <clears throat> Okay. Someone asked about watching movies. I think watching movies is fine. It's a it's a passive exercise, but of course exposing yourself to English in any manner is going to help. All right, there, there are a lot of good questions. I've answered a lot of these. It's in some degrees um, now, I'm going to address this because this is an interesting one that people have mentioned to me. Uh, someone has mentioned, I'm from India. Does accent matter? I think, now I'm going to tell you my own belief. I think this is a personal decision. If you like your accent, keep it. I don't think you should change it. A lot of people aren't happy with it. Let me tell you where it is a problem. If your accent is so strong, your pronunciation is so strong that people don't understand you, then, then it's a problem. And for some Indian accents, it's a problem if you're living in England or in America or somewhere else. Sometimes some people have problems uh, with some words or some syllables or pronunciation. So this is a problem in terms of communication. A lot of people, however, just want to soften their accent a bit or maybe make it more, I don't know, just slightly different. And I think that's fine and I'm willing to help people do that if they want. But in general, I think you should be proud of your accent. But if you want to change it a little bit, I understand my accent changed over time. I mentioned that last week. So this is a very personal matter, but it's also practical. If people aren't understanding you, then you need to reassess your accent and perhaps make some changes, which we will start doing together in November. Oh. That's interesting. <laughs> I wonder, okay. Someone's asked where I'm from. I'm from the United States. I lived a lot in England, so I have sort of, a, in Europe, so I have a sort of a mixed accent, I suppose. All right, we're going through, we're near the end. Oh, procrastination. If you procrastinate, you put off. You don't, you don't do it when you should or could do it. You wait until the last minute. This is to procrastinate. And a lot of students are master procrastinators. They wait until the last minute to study for an exam. <clears throat> All right, a lot of these questions I have already addressed. Some of them are very good. All right. This is an interesting question. As a teacher, what can you do to make speaking more interesting? I think your ideas, what you're talking about, the content of the conversation will dictate how interesting that talk is. 
All right, I think we're nearly finished. I want to thank all of you for Okay, so someone has just asked, so I'll say, if your country doesn't have PayPal, then I will not ask you to pay. You will just share my post, you'll share it and tag me, and that's your payment. You don't pay. So I, what I want to do is make the pronunciation course available for everybody, which means if your country, and I have a list, I'll show you the list, there's a list of countries. I don't want to disadvantage you. So you can, we call it payment in kind. Payment in kind. I-N and then kind. It means that you pay in a different manner, which is advertising my post and letting other people have the opportunity to join the course. So if your country doesn't have PayPal, don't panic. I want to help everybody. All right. Good question. How can I practice writing? You can always write. No one is stopping you from writing. And the key is to get good feedback on your writing. All right. Someone's asked about... Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're nearly finished. I just... Let me just say thank you very much. Let me just... Um, let me just recap one more time. Define, first of all, assess what your level is. Define your goal. Why are you learning English? Be specific. And then address the difference between your level and your, your goal. And use very effective means, often in the form of textbooks, to reach these. But if you're not sure, ask a qualified teacher. They, and all of us know English teachers, we're everywhere. We are everywhere in the world. So you can always ask qualified teachers about that. And I want to thank you all for a very good 45 minutes. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was productive. And I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye-bye.